Hey, what is going on everybody and welcome to the College Info Geek Podcast, the internet's best resource for students looking to get ahead, but a terrible resource for learning how to change the rap game. Oh no. Now I've done that at least two times. I know you've done that one or two times in the past before. I try. But it's just something that comes out of the essence of who you are. Yeah, you, can't the, you can't learn teach it. it, right? You you're born with that. You can't teach dopeness. You. you can't teach freshness. You can't teach legitness i'm too legit to quit <laughs> so unfortunately you're not going to learn how to change the game on this episode but what we do have for you guys are five questions because once again we're doing a five questions episodes episode this is one of my favorite types of episodes to do so i'm stoked yep yeah anyway intro time my name is thomas frank i'm here as always with my good friend martin bamey and uh yeah we're gonna do five questions today I noticed that you actually put some piano up on your Instagram. I did do that, so which, apparently... is, which is a little untimely because it was right after the music episode, and I think it's better proof of what I can do on piano <laughs> than the previous thing. But yeah, 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 I didn't write it till Thursday, so what are you going to yeah. do? Was it? I actually hadn't um, listened to it yet because I was just doing something while scrolling through Instagram, but was that the same thing that you were playing today? Yeah. Cool. That sounded... yeah, it's got like six crossovers in, yeah. in a part of it, which is... I really like it. It's fun. So my vote that I put on your story for you to put longer music on Spotify stands. Okay. Uh, maybe I'll make an album at some point. Yeah. And when you want to record at some point, I mean, I don't know. Like we both have pretty good pianos now. Yeah. But I don't know if they're in the correct spaces for just recording the pure audio. But yours can do the MIDI just like mine, right? Yeah. Well, you can also do like the same output you get from an electric guitar. I don't oh, know what so that's called. Oh, so you could called. just use their sound engine and yeah. record from that? Yeah, I believe so. Okay. So you could do that, or we could just, you know, go with MIDI and then use one of my native instruments, pianos, and try something like that. Yeah. I've been itching to get some time to really dig into some of those libraries I got. So that might be a cool way to start experimenting with the piano ones they have. Yeah. There's a really nice one called Unicorda that's in there, and there's one that's like a grand piano as well. The annoying thing is they keep releasing new instruments that are not part of the pack that I got. Oh, yeah. Like, they just released this really beautiful mallet library with, like, xylophones and whatever the other versions of things that are like xylophones are. Whack-a-moles. Whack yeah, whack-a-moles. I'm sure there's a whack-a-mole library the in there, The sound of a mole being whacked. <laughs> it's real ones, too. That's a, it's a great... We got all kinds of small rodents library. being whacked with a variety of different instruments. It's beautiful. <laughs> PETA's favorite... <laughs> Yeah. EST library. Oh, they love it. Yeah. Um, so it might be fun to experiment with the piano one at some point. Anyway, we have got five questions this week, and I don't think we have any super special announcements. Did I tell people last week that we're hiring? I don't I don't know. Hmm. I'll say it again then. Uh, we are still hiring for an animator slash motion graphics artist slash illustrator. So if you are somebody who knows your way around After Effects, knows what an easing curve is, knows how to mask things, You've played with the rotoscope tool before, that kind of stuff. I am looking for someone to help me and my editor do better on our YouTube channel, make some better animations, kind of start nudging our way towards that crash course and curse cassettes quality level. Uh, so if that is you, then you can go over to collegeinfogeek.com slash jobs, and there's a link there for the application. Um, there's no deadline, which is probably fine because this podcast will be out for a long time. Uh, yeah. But we will hire somebody once I get time to go through the applications once we find somebody who fits the bill. So yeah, get on it if that's you. Um, let's get into these questions. And briefly, before we start with the first one, uh, these five questions episodes come from questions that we find via email, via Instagram DMs occasionally, a lot of times via Twitter. So if you want to have one of your questions featured on a future five questions episode, then uh, Twitter's probably the best place to send us questions if they're short. I'm Tom Frankly over there. And you are Yo Martholomew, right? Yep. Uh, we also have Instagram, exact same usernames there, but uh, full transparency, I do not check Instagram DMs anymore. I'm kind of deprioritizing Instagram a little bit. That's fair. Because, I don't know, the, the most ROI comes from YouTube and Twitter and the podcast, things like that, I think. You know, yeah. In terms of business growth, YouTube, for sure, actual products, things like that. And in terms of connections and you know that not stressing me out, Twitter is so much better. Yeah, and I don't even check all my Instagram DMs because I, I just get on there to post photos, and I haven't yeah. even been doing that because everything's about to bloom, but it has not yet. That's true, yeah. Though you did post a cool piano photo. I did. Well, my piano bloomed. 
It did bloom. Yeah, <laughs> it's actually it, a pretty good metaphor. <laughs> <laughs> you traded in the rental for something much better. Yeah. All right, so let's get into the first question here, which goes, some days I'll wake up at 5 a.m., I'll go to the gym, and then generally I'll have more than enough time for everything in my day and still have free time at the end. But on other days, I'll oversleep until 9 to 10 a.m. and everything is thrown off. So how can I be more consistent with my good days? And I think I remember reading this question. Yeah. I think we got it via yep. email, and I think the person may have specifically said, like, every other day. I yeah, it was like they've day. got their A days and they've got their B days. That's what it was, yeah. So like they they basically use up all of their mental energy and all their self-discipline on A day and then they have like a recovery day the yeah. next day or something. Um, I have to wonder if this, is a, if this is a consistent pattern, if this person is pushing themselves too hard on day A. Yeah. Like self-discipline is something that's worth cultivating, but if you know, you're waking up Monday at 5 a.m. and you're just blasting yourself until – midnight if you're just working constantly you know i think there, there are certain people out there who can do that long term every single day but a lot of people are going to burn out if they don't have a decent cycle of work and rest on a daily basis and i think that's what's probably going to cause this so it's very possible this person's on a 48 hour cycle and they feel guilty because the world is telling you you need to be on a 24 hour cycle of you know perfect behavior every single day yeah and so then there's also, you know, like the obvious stuff, like if you're just not sleeping enough, of course, day B isn't going to be good, mm -hmm. you know, because you just said you overslept, maybe you're not sleeping enough and all that stuff. Um, I've actually found that for me, sometimes it's determined by how my morning goes unrelated to how, how much I've slept. It's like I've started a recent habit where I've been, you know, clear to neutral with my mm -hmm. kitchen, my work desk and the living room. And that's at night, right? Yeah. I, so before you go to before, bed. Before I, before I go to bed. I will clean the kitchen, my work desk, and living room so that they're all in, like, perfect condition for the morning. Mm -hmm. And then um, sometimes I'll do a bit of yoga after that to kind of wind down and make myself stop just, I don't know, watching It's Always Sunny or something. <laughs> and then it'll be cool because when I wake up, everything is immediately ready. I can make breakfast. I can get ready for work. I can sit down and work. Nothing's in the way. Yeah. Whereas for me, if I don't do that, I will wake up. I will say, I want to make breakfast. Oh, I can't. That stuff's on the counter. I don't really, I don't have the energy to fix that right now. I guess yeah. I'll just do something else. And I just, I just won't eat. I'll just procrastinate eating entirely. And then that will procrastinate everything else. Yeah. And then if my morning can't start off right, I'm ruined if I haven't started everything well in the first hour or two. Yeah. If you get derailed, it's hard to make yourself jump back on in the middle of the day. Yeah. So it's like, what, what's the very first thing that's happening on day A that's different? Well, you're oversleeping. Is there anything else? Mm -hmm. that could also be a factor. Yeah, and I mean, they didn't give us a whole lot of detail, so some yeah. of these could so just be total just guesses. Kind of guess. um, but I think you're right, like making sure that your morning goes well sets you up for being more disciplined during the rest of the day, for sure. Sleep is a big thing there. Um, I have found that the reason that I, I thought of this whole 48-hour thing is because I know when I push myself super hard on one day, it's very likely that I'm not going to uphold the same standard the next day. Yeah, which is bad. On you know, those days, I also find myself saying, whoa, I can do this now? Suddenly, everything must be perfect and great forever. This is my new standard. Mm, I say that too. Yeah. Like, this is the new me. I'll get a video done, and there's like this 48-hour high after a video goes out, goes out where I'm just like, oh, okay, there's something recent up on the channel. I can kind of like ease off a bit. I have, I have flexibility. Oh, you know, the world is my oyster. Not realizing that there's probably 10 other projects that still need to be done. They were just deprioritized because the video yeah. became a priority. Yeah. And it's like, no, you need to get on a more consistent schedule so you don't have this constant uh, volatile cycle of feeling horribly overwhelmed and stressed and then feeling like there's all this freedom that doesn't really exist. Yeah, like I set my standards when I feel good and everything went great. But then on the days where it's not perfect, so this person, maybe they're setting their standard for what they want on day A, according to day A. Mm -hmm. Day A is great. But on day B, maybe that's a realistic scenario that just happens because of things outside of their control. It's the standards that are going to make them really unhappy that day. Because yeah. why even try it all on day B if you can't get day A's stuff? Mm -hmm. Sure, you could get half as much. But it, I think it's really easy when you can't get quite what you want to just say, eh, you know what, whatever, throw the whole thing out. I don't, <coughs> I don't care. Like you have a budget, you go a dollar over and you're just like, why not go $50 over? The budget's dead to me. Yeah. And it's like the, the what the hell effect. Yeah. That I read about. Yeah. So basically, if you're setting your standards this high, then any second you can't have a perfect day, 
mm-hmm. it's going to become a nothing day because it wasn't worth trying at all. Yeah. I liked what you said a few weeks ago about how your your piano practice goal is short, but then you always overshoot it by a lot. And yeah. it's less intimidating than being like, I will practice for an hour a day. Oh, uh, then it's the like, one no. day you're it's like eleven fifty nine and you're like, I haven't I didn't have time for piano today. Well, I guess I'll be staying up till twelve forty. Yeah. And I mean there's a there's a balance to be struck there. Because the next point I wanted to make is if if B days are not working so well for this person, I wonder if they're just operating off of pure motivation. They don't actually have systems in place to encourage them to be more consistent. Because when I bet you a hundred bucks that I would read twenty five pages a day for three months, I did that. I did not every receive single day one hundred dollars. It nope. didn't happen. <laughs> I I remember Quentin also being like, "Can I beat on that bet too? Because I'll I'll try to sabotage you." <laughs> Yeah, that's, that's why well, you that, don't get to be part of that. That's how you bet. know who not to do that. Because I know with. you don't actually want the hundred dollars. No, that's you not would just useful. Be disappointed. Also, I mean, <laughs> if you're if you're successful with your goals, this business continues to succeed, and I benefit more than a really short sighted screw Tom over for a hundred dollars. Yeah, you're gonna terrible. get a hundred bucks, but our business is gonna decline, <laughs> and be, you're gonna lose a thousand dollars. Like the worst <laughs> idea, or more. Yeah, so. If you're having trouble being consistent with your habits, um, ask yourself, like, do I have anything that is encouraging me externally to keep up with these things? I mean, something really useful for me was having that tweet scheduled for 6, 10 a.m. that said, like, hey, if you see this, I'm still sleeping in. Yeah. You know, I'll give you five bucks and PayPal. I would wake up every single day and delete that thing and then stay up. Or just using something like um, Habitica. Just... Being able to see that streak or even something like your little journal thing. Yeah. Where it's just two weeks and you're checking off boxes and then you reevaluate so you don't have to deal with the pressure of, I don't know, 50 day streaks or whatever, but you at least have something you're measuring. Yeah. Yeah. I don't want to measure nothing because then uh, who knows if I'm succeeding and largely I won't hit my potential. But if I, if I set the standards too high, I'll do just as badly because I'll get one or two days where I'm great. And then the rest of those boxes will be X's because, yep, yep you failed 18 days in a row. Good work. Yeah, good job. Yeah, don't want to see those X's. Yeah. So use trackers, use commitment devices, find ways to keep yourself disciplined. Maybe find an accountability partner who doesn't actually want the $100 or whatever it is you're betting them. Yeah. But they will just use that as like a, I don't know, what's the sort of Damocles yeah. over your head. And if you slip up, it's coming down on you. So I don't know. I found that to be very effective personally. And some people don't really respond well to consequence based challenges like that. But I do. Yeah. I don't know. I feel like my entire life has just been bettering myself because there's a stick rather than a carrot that is threatening to come down on me. Yeah, I, I, and usually and I put like the sometimes there. that can go too far, and then like a positive motivator is a good thing. But mm-hmm. there, there's something to be said about the occasional punishment motivator. If that hundred dollars yeah. doesn't matter to you, also, maybe your friend should be like, "Yeah, and I'm going to use that to buy boxes and boxes and boxes of crickets, and I will let them loose in your room." <laughs> hundred dollars worth of crickets. That's a lot of crickets. It is a lot of crickets. That's we've seen what you can buy. Like you can buy boxes. I, I think crickets. I would just move out. If I had to had that many crickets in my apartment. Yep. Um, And this isn't to say that I never use positive motivators. I just think that my positive motivators tend to be the benefits of long-term goals. Yeah. Like I never say, oh, I'm going to put in 20 minutes of work and then as a reward, I'll let myself play Overwatch or I'll let myself go rollerblading or something. I never really do that. That's fair. It's more like I'm going to do this work. Otherwise you know, you get a hundred dollars or Beeminder is going to charge me a bunch of money or I have to do laundry for a week or some stupid thing like that. And then the, I don't know, the, the product of many days or weeks or months of work putting in creates a positive benefit. Yeah. And I know that's coming. So there's a balance to be struck there, but find a way to track and maybe externally motivate yourself if internal motivation isn't doing the trick. Uh, Question number two. In the past, why have you chosen to make changes to your morning routine? When do you know to break an effective habit? Okay. So yes. Th- yeah, why do you is... choose to make changes to your routines? Yeah, it seems Can like you just it's pick all the working. perfect one and then just do it until and you die. Yeah, you could just do that until you die. Yeah. Um, I tend to change my habits when they're working on, even if they're working on paper and I'm getting everything done, when they stop being inspiring mm, for yep. me, I am. 
you know, I, I have basically an existential crisis every day, so I'm very sensitive to whether my life is going to be something repeated forever until I die. Yeah. So when something stops inspiring me, I'm like, well, I can't have that be forever. So I'm just going to throw that out and and recalibrate everything. And I, I do yeah. that a lot. Recently, I stopped my daily reading because I'm just not in the right space. I just was like, you know what? I actually am not in the mood to read at all. I just don't care right now about this fictional mm. story. I want to play piano or something. Yeah. And allowing it to be different because sure, I would be succeeding. I'd be reading a bunch of books, but if they're not bringing me the the joy that they would normally bring me, then I'm not actually succeeding. Yeah. So that's basically what it's about for me. And then if you're stuck in a rut for a long time, sometimes it's nice to just start everything over. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it comes back again to what we talked about in the previous question where there's this focus on the 24 hour cycle. And in many cases, that is a useful model to use. You should probably, you know, have a few times a day you eat and you should sleep once every 24 hour cycle, at least once. What are you, what are you looking at? <laughs> How many crickets I could buy for a... <laughs> <laughs> Not even listening to this insightful piece of information. <laughs> Actually, you know what? I now want to know the answer to this something, question. Uh, so I will continue my point. Looks like something about 8,000 at the moment. <laughs> So now that that's solved, <laughs> I'm not going to go wasting my money at 8,000 crickets, but it, it does <laughs> amuse me to know that's you can. so many. <laughs> it does amuse me to know you can buy that many. <laughs> also, like, Ooh. how many calories are in a cricket? Like, you could probably, I don't know. I you don't could probably eat switch your protein source over to crickets and save a lot of money if oh, you the, weren't a vegetarian. The, yeah, it, that's that's true. If, you, if you're down to eat crickets, they're an incredibly uh, renewable. Yeah. Eco-friendly and protein-dense, cost-effective source of food. And we may have to get used to them at some point. I do remember in Blade Runner 2049, the, the movie starts at like a grub farm because they're not like real meat. Or I don't know what real meat is, but cows and chickens and everything are too expensive or extinct or whatever at that point in the future. So everyone just eats fattened up grubs and crickets. I'm down to be a vegetarian <laughs> there you go and, yeah and uh but you know if you, maybe it would work better if you could get all the crickets to work together and they would form the shape of a cow and they'd wear a cow <laughs> suit kind of like ants that you know in movies they all yeah. form one giant thing and then it will make it taste the same i think so animals just need to identify as another kind of animal to taste like that animal. <laughs> this is facts <laughs> anyway what i was trying to say is there's like this this fixation on the 24 hour schedule. But I mean, what is the overall goal? So it takes something like reading, right? The overall goal is to make sure that you're learning new things on a continued basis over your lifetime. That's my goal at least, right? Yeah. My goal isn't to say I read 25 pages a day. It's to say I am learning things across a wide span of topics, wide breadth of knowledge. You know, I'm, I'm continuing to progress and evolve and learn over time. And that can happen in many different forms. You could sit in a chair and you could, you know, flip a dead tree bound together with glue and learn that way. Or you could wake up and practice piano for an hour. That's still learning. And to feel like you're failing because you didn't read a book for an hour because you did that. But you're just like, I feel like a failure because I, I wanted that to be a daily habit forever. That's kind of pointless. You're confusing the metric senseless. with the purpose. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So... This is something that uh, I've, I've read many, many blogs warn against for business owners. Um, you got to know what metrics matter because there are so many different metrics that you could track. You could track like, you know, raw page views to your website or visitors or views on videos or how many likes did we get on this post, all that kind of stuff. But a lot of those metrics don't actually matter very much. Yeah. Like what really matters and to know what really matters in terms of metrics, you have to know what, what actually matters to you in terms of goals and priorities and values. Yeah. So for me, the value is continued learning, you know, business wise, do more that helps people, but also live a happy, fulfilled life where I continually learn new things. And I'm kind of in the same boat as you right now. Um, I'm reading a book, but I'm not putting in a ton of time every single day to read it because I would rather practice piano and guitar. Yeah. That's just where my interest is right, right now. And I don't feel like the hours put there are less valuable. Now, if I caught myself playing hours of video games every single day, then I might ask myself, like, why are you giving up the reading time for this? This isn't that useful. This should just be a break at the end of the day. 
Yeah. But what I'm doing with these hours instead is valuable to me. And I, I see long-term value in it. So your priorities change because you may take on new interests. You may enter a new chapter of life. I think it's useful to constantly evaluate what you care about and then see if your routines and habits actually match up to that. You know? Yeah. I'm not the same person I was five years ago. If I was doing the habits that I thought were important then, I would mm -hmm. probably feel pretty unfulfilled now because I, I just don't care about those things to the same degree. Yeah. Yeah. I'm not learning Japanese anymore. Yeah. You are. Uh, I this cared true. a lot about yeah, learning Japanese when I was going to go to Japan, but... That's yeah, a perfect mean, situation where it makes sense and there's a good motivator mm -hmm. for it. Yeah, but now I want to do other things. And I mean, there's so many justifications I can make, like, oh, it would still be useful. I put in all this time. Like, wouldn't it be cool to be bilingual? But the truth of the matter is, I don't have plans to go back to Japan for a while. It doesn't change my life very much. You I know? don't watch a whole lot of anime. Like, I don't need to know Japanese. And it would be more fulfilling for me personally to be able to play and sing the guitar or to be able to compose something on the piano. Yeah, it's got to be fulfilling. Like, mm -hmm. I, I can speak Spanish, a decent amount of French and stuff, and I'm learning Japanese. What does that do for me on a daily basis? If <laughs> I, not, not much. If I didn't like it, there would be no reason to. Yeah. So, like, if it's not fulfilling, you shouldn't. And that's how I feel that we should, we should be considering everything that mm -hmm. we kind of make ourselves do through a system. Yeah. And I think it's also important to realize that like life happens in, in fluctuating levels of intensity. So sometimes maybe we're going through a period of time where there's a crazy big project that we're working on for College Info Geek. And that means there's fewer hours in the day for personal things. I might scale down what I'm doing for exercise. Instead of going to the gym for an hour and doing three sets of each exercise, I might just do one or two. I had to scale down everything finishing the website mm -hmm. because I was just like huge project. nonstop. I live for the website for mm -hmm. like several weeks during that last stretch. And but now it's done. But that's that's how life is. Mm -hmm. It can't be the same way forever. Yeah. Now the website's done and the fruits of your labor have been realized. I mean Yes, yeah, so now I have it, time for a Japanese. So much later. better. So mm -hmm. But it so. would have been really dumb for me to focus on that at that time. Yeah, I don't know if you could have put like just a little bit of time into the website every single day. Because there's like that compounding benefit of really delving into something and being yeah, uber you, focused I needed on it for to be, hours. I needed to live in that system for me to, to make any progress. Or every day I would have spent half of my 20 minutes figuring out what was even going on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, which method was I working on? Which file did I have open? Yeah. You know, it takes time to get into things so like that. There's like different cycles in life. And if you try to make every day the same, it's just, it's going to fail at some point or you're going to not like it at some point. Yeah. This week's episode of our show is brought to you by our friends over at Audible, which is the best place on the internet to get your hands on audiobooks. Now, if you've been listening to this podcast for any length of time, or maybe watch some of my videos, then you'll probably know that I am a huge fan of listening to audiobooks. I do a lot of really long bike rides, got to get them Strava miles in. Uh, I do a lot of cooking, a lot of cleaning around the house. And anytime I'm doing something where I don't really have to focus too hard on it, or if I'm just cooking something or going on a bike ride, I want to use that time to learn something new or maybe intake a story. And audiobooks are the way that I choose to do that. And Audible, again, is the best place on the internet to get your hands on audiobooks because they have an unmatched selection of audiobook titles across a ton of different genres. They have sci-fi and fantasy, they have science and technology, they've got biographies, all kinds of stuff, including lots of the bestsellers, the obscure stuff, and our recommendations this week. Every time we do an ad for Audible, we like to do some recommendations for audiobooks that you might want to try listening to. And if you want to get either of our two recommendations for free, you can actually get a free 30-day trial of Audible with one free audiobook download of your choosing by going over to audible.com slash CIG or by texting CIG to 500-500 on your phone. And I'll spell that out real quick for you here. A-U-D-I-B-L-E dot com slash CIG. So like I said, we love to do recommendations for these ad spots. And I'm going to ask for yours first this week, my friend. Well, uh, see, I've recommended this book before, but I'm feeling really nostalgic about it. Kind of okay. want to reread it. So I'm going to go ahead and, and say The Buried Giant by Kazuo Ishiguro. It's... Uh, about an elderly couple who go on a fantasy adventure. Oh, yeah. It's, it's, the, it's Didn't you say so, that's like one of the only books you've ever read where the protagonist is It's just, an, yeah, an elderly couple. Like, they have memory problems and every... It's just so out of the box, you know? I kind of want to reread it. That book's great. Okay. I also have a fictional recommendation this week. 
So I think this may be the first time where we both have recommended fiction. Double fiction. Double fiction, yeah. And there's plenty of nonfiction stuff on Audible to choose from. Power of Habits on there. My book, 10 Steps to Earning Awesome Grades is on there. You could get that one. Or you could get my favorite book that I listened to, I think in 2017 at this point, because time keeps on slipping into the future. Uh, but it is The Martian by Andy Weir. And I also listened to Artemis this year. Uh, actually, I think it was 2018. Really enjoyed Artemis, but there is a special place in my heart for The Martian. I absolutely loved that audiobook, and I think it's probably time for me to go through it again. It's one of my absolute favorite science fiction books. So you should definitely give that a listen at some point. Uh, once again, if you want to get a free audiobook download, it could be The Martian, could be The Buried Giant, or it could be anything else within their library. You can go to audible.com slash CIG or text CIG to 500, 500 on your phone. And once you are a member, you're going to get one credit every single month, which is good for any audiobook in their library, plus two Audible originals that you cannot get anywhere else and access to audio workout programs. Big thanks as always goes out to Audible for sponsoring this podcast, being a big supporter of our show, and we also have to thank our second sponsor this week, FreshBooks. FreshBooks is an amazing solution for automating or making much more efficient all the accounting and invoicing things that go on in the businesses of freelancers or independent business owners like ourselves and like many of the people who work for us. So if you're somebody who charges people money to do graphic design maybe or do video editing or do web design or any kind of freelance work, you know that in addition to the actual freelance work that you're getting paid for, there's other things you have to do, including sending invoices out to clients and doing the accounting, tracking the expenses, making sure that everything in your books is set up correctly just in case you get audited or just to know how much money you're actually making and to know whether or not you're profitable. And I can tell you from experience, this stuff takes a lot of time, which is why FreshBooks is a great solution since their users save on average up to 192 hours per year using their tool. And let's say you charge even 50 bucks an hour for web design, which is, a, I would say, a pretty standard or even low rate, right? Yeah, if, if you're a good web designer, I would say that's low. It's pretty low, yeah. But so 50 bucks times 192, that's, that's not a small deal. So if you can find a way to automate your processes, if you can find a way to spend more time doing the actual work that you make money doing and that you actually like doing, then that's a win for you. And that is exactly what FreshBooks helps you do. They help you do that in a couple of different ways. Number one, they let you generate professional looking invoices that have beautiful templates in less than 30 seconds. Send them out to your clients. You can actually see when your clients have seen them. So there's no weird guessing games there. And you can let your clients pay via those invoices with their credit cards. So it's a lot more convenient for them. They're going to be happy working with you and you get paid a lot faster as well. Additionally, they have tools for automating your expense tracking. They can actually pull in transactions from your bank statements. Then you can just code them and that's exactly what I do that makes things a lot more efficient and you can even attach receipts from your phone by taking pictures of them and using their mobile app to do that so if you want to get a full featured free 30-day trial of FreshBooks then head over to freshbooks.com slash CIG and when you do that remember to also enter a college info geek in that how did you hear about us section once again freshbooks.com slash CIG and big thanks to FreshBooks for sponsoring this episode and supporting our show let's get back into it Alrighty, question number three which is out of all of these, this was probably my favorite question, so I'm excited to talk about it. Well, don't play favorites, Tom. That's mean. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to play favorites. I'm going to be mean. I don't care. How can I block out negative energies and comments from other people and keep them from demotivating me? Um, I immediately gravitated to this question because I am writing a video about how to take criticism. Well, that works. And I don't know when this video is going to come out because I, I really want to kind of crystallize my thoughts but this is actually a good opportunity to do it yeah um so in my head i see criticism as having two different dimensions there is the objective dimension where there's a you know legit criticism against either you or something that you've made or something you know or whatever it is they have grievances with something that exists in the real world and then there's the emotional dimension of criticism because when somebody hurls criticism or they insult you or they're trolling you or whatever that's an attack on your character or your ego or something that you care about. So you feel bad about it, right? Yeah. So I think it's useful to look at these two elements as completely separate because how you process them is going to be very different. Um, and I want to start with the emotional dimension because I think this is where people have the most trouble dealing with criticism. It hurts. It stings. And like, how do you get over that? How do you keep that from demotivating you for the rest of the day? How do you keep it from you know, driving you to quit what you're doing because you feel so hurt by it. 
the first thing that I ask myself is, what are the intentions of the person who has just criticized me? Because you have all kinds of different critics. You have people who give you well-constructed, positive, meaningful criticism. You've got people who maybe mean well, but they don't know how to tactfully criticize you. So what they say comes across as blunt or mean. Uh, you might have haters who literally just like to hate things. You may have trolls who just get their kicks making other people angry or sad. There's all kinds of reasons. There's people who just insult other people to build themselves up. There's people who just insult people because they're mean and they wanna watch the world burn. What are the intentions of the person who are, who's saying this to you? Um, and either they're gonna be good, like they have your best interest in mind. What they're saying is coming from a place of wanting you to improve. It might be because they genuinely love you, like a friend. It might be because they just wanna see something better and they don't actually care much about you, but they just they would like your work to be better. Either way, there's one group of people who they are criticizing you out of a good place. And then there's people who are just criticizing you because they wanna hurt you or because they're selfish or because their intentions are otherwise not very noble. And I think in the moment, it's going to hurt no matter what. And there's really not much you can do about it other than just work on building a thicker hide, I guess, in the moment, like being able to rationalize an attack like that. But once that initial hurt is done, I think it's useful to tell yourself, like if this criticism came from a person who did not have my best interest in mind, then emotionally, like there is zero value in their message. It doesn't mean that they as a person have no value. And I think like it's, it's kind of a duty for for human beings to try to help each other when they realize that you know somebody is operating from a place of hate or a place of selfishness or low self-esteem or whatever but the message itself decoupled from the person is worthless like it's literally a dog barking at you or you know being at the zoo and like a monkey throwing poo at you it's like of that level of value oh, that was personal <laughs> that monkey was constructively criticizing you i'm sorry monkey day. You got to you got to throw something else. This isn't constructive. Right? So like and this is something that I actively think about. This person's message is worth less than a dog barking at me. And I think it's actually worth less because a dog doesn't really know why it's barking. It's just barking because it's an animal, but a person has the rational capability to decide that I'm going to act in a way that contributes something positive to the world. They have the ability to choose to do that. It may be harder for certain people to do that than others because of life circumstances, but everyone has the ability to choose the intention of what they say. And this person has chosen not to do that. So, cool, you, have, you don't have my best intentions in mind, you're just out to hurt me. Your messages, your communications to me, they are useless and I'm gonna disregard them. So that's like the emotional dimension. And then like you have to realize that like that is different than the factual dimension because even the most hateful troll might say something that you could use. Like even a broken clock is right twice a day. Yeah, it's just that you they know? saw a fact that was true and they were like, ha, they're not gonna like that fact. I will use it yeah. to hurt them. But it doesn't mean it's not a fact. Yeah, exactly. Like they may be out to be like, ha, gotcha. I feel good. Don't you feel so crappy? And yeah, like emotionally, I'm gonna be like, that was useless. Thank you for nothing. But actually, you may have pointed out something that I can improve. So thank you again. Yeah. You know? And then if the person is coming from a place of good intentions, they actually do care about you, then you have to acknowledge that as well. And then from there, you can start to make decisions on, you know, what was the tone of their message? Is this actually constructive? Um, a lot of criticism comes from a place of either ignorance or it comes from a place of like their perspective is important, but it's not necessarily important enough for you to make a change. Good example, every video I do, I get at least one person saying, please talk slower. And I get at least one person saying, please speak faster, you speak too slow. <laughs> I'm like, okay, this feedback isn't all that useful for me. Like one piece of it isn't going to influence me much because I realize like I'm putting videos out to the world. So native English speaker, uh, speakers who are in a huge hurry are watching. I've got people who can hear me just fine, understand anything at any rate of speech, but they would love to sit back and just intake it and they have all the time in the world. And then there's somebody who may just barely speak English and they're using my videos to learn English. Like all three of them have different but valid perspectives, but I can't, I can't change for all of them. Yeah, that wouldn't make any sense. I mean, you could just, if you want them faster, just change it, make it like 1.5 times. You can do yeah. that. 
problem solved. Yeah, there. And that's, but but yeah, you can't solve it for everyone. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of times I've said like, oh, cool. Here's here's an extension you can put on Chrome that plays my videos at 0.9 times speed, like that's just a little bit slower for you. And I have taken you know uh, rate of speech feedback. I think when I first started, I talked way too fast. I think now I'm at a point where it's pretty good. So I'm not taking feedback like that too much into account anymore. But you have to ask yourself, like, does this feedback actually make sense? Uh, You have to go to your personal values, your personal taste, your own expertise and consult that and kind of make a comparison there. And then I guess the one last thing that I want to say is sometimes people do have good intentions, but they just don't know how to communicate them tactfully. Um, and a lot of times this isn't even like, it's not that they're socially unaware. There may just be different customs and norms. Yeah. Like, um, our friend Benny Lewis originally from Ireland has talked a lot about how Americans tend to sugarcoat their criticism a lot more. They tend to beat around the bush a little bit. Whereas he's used to people being very blunt. Like even when it comes to something like weight, like you just be like, you'll just point things out. Like, hey, maybe you should exercise more. Yeah. And if you come from a culture like ours, that's going to seem abrasive. That's going to seem mean. You might initially think that this person's just being a troll. But in reality, they're just used to being a little more blunt and they are used to calling things out. That's how their culture does things. And they didn't even know they needed to take your feelings into account when saying that thing. Yeah, they may just think Americans are babies. Yeah. And maybe we are babies. <laughs> Well, we like everything sugar-coated, our food it's and true. our words. Yeah, everything should have at least some sugar in it. I Otherwise, coat my I'm... steak with a nice sugar rub. Yeah, a little bit of powdered sugar on the Frosting. steak. Frosting. Makes it great. Just... A little bit of whipped cream. Sprinkles, M&Ms. <laughs> I don't like it anymore. Yum. I changed my mind. <laughs> I don't think you eat a lot of steak anyway. <laughs> well, I don't want it, especially with all that other and stuff. You, you know what? I don't eat a whole lot of steak either. I'm yeah. a huge fan of steak or even cow. Well, you haven't tried it with enough sugary stuff. That's on top. true. I haven't put enough <laughs> ice cream toppings on my steak. Yeah. So if it's if it's a relationship worth cultivating, and somebody comes at you a little more bluntly than you would like, then tell them. You know. Yeah. Well, like, especially if they're coming to your country, and, and you just you just be like, hey, just so you're aware, people will take offense to that. Yeah. Here. Or even say like, I like that. It was a little too blunt for me. Yeah. You know, and you could also try to work on your own ego and your own ability to process criticism at the same time. But if you think that it would be worth them being a little more tactful, then maybe tell them in a friendly way. Like that was a little blunt. I appreciate your intention, but it was, you know, you could have at least <laughs> massaged my ego a little bit. Yeah. And I guess you don't feel too bad about it because think of every successful person, they receive these things. Mm-hmm. They get negative feedback. They get... Hurtful yep. things. People will, for absolutely no reason, despise somebody who's like famous for some reason or another. Yeah, you'll get haters you no know? matter what. You know, people get death threats, especially politicians, and some of them, like, you know, th- maybe they just wanted to do something good at first and then they fell into a thing and now they're getting death threats. Like, l- life's hard. All the most successful people <laughs> put up with tons of negative energy all yeah, the time. Go to like any Bob Ross thread on Reddit and then go to the way bottom. There's bound to be somebody who's like super downvoted, like negative 100. But yeah. They still said that they hated Bob Ross. And like, how? How do you? But <laughs> yeah. some people, man. Yeah. You know, and even successful people make mistakes sometimes. Um, I mean, I I put a post on Instagram. I think this was like a year ago, but I put up a post on Instagram at the time that I thought was insightful and great. It was actually super tone deaf. And I got a bunch of hate on it. And like, it, oh, it wasn't no. like horrible, but. It was definite criticism and people kind of call it out like you probably shouldn't have posted that. So I deleted it and I was like, and I messaged the people who called me out. And I was like, thank you. At first I was, I was like emotionally distraught for a little bit because I was just like, oh no, I screwed up. I'm a horrible person, but no, I just am human, made a mistake. Mm, but at least and that response was better than the traditional internet response of doubling down, even if you're wrong. Yeah, it's true. You know, this guy because, is Because green. you're responding to the emotional feelings you have yeah. first you feel hurt so you want to strike back mm-hmm. rather than w- say wait a second they have a point yeah it sucks but it is a point and that was the process like got those negative comments at first i was like oh no i feel really terrible now i feel like crap and 
I don't know, the way emotions work, like negative emotions just love to overpower positive ones. And, and, you know, when I'm just mired in that, I'm like, all my work is useless. Everything I've done up until this point, totally moot because now I screwed up and everyone's going to hate me forever. That's super irrational. So you just have to let those emotions subside. And then, yeah, if you screwed up, you got to just own up to it. Yeah. And actually own up to it. Don't just try to make it go away. People don't like that. Um, and I guess just I, one last thing I'll say here is there's always going to be haters. So you have to focus on why you're doing what you're doing. And if you care about it, that needs to be your main area of focus. You're kind of guiding light. If you're too focused on feedback from other people, then negative comments, negative energy will drag you down more than if you have like a strong internal sense of why you're doing what you're doing or having a strong internal base of confidence. Yeah. So work on building those. Uh, question number four, Thomas, you seem like a high performing person. Do high performing people have quarter life crises, crises, crises? Yeah, I think it's crises, but crises. you know, I've never double checked, but we'll go with it. If so, how do you deal with it? Well, what you do, you get yourself a pair of aviator sunglasses, brand new snazzy haircut mm. and a sports car. Well, it's a, since it's only quarter life, though, it's got to be half as expensive as your midlife crisis. Yeah, when car. you're when you turn forty, you get a better one. You get a Corvette crisis. When you have your quarter life crisis, you buy a used Miata off of Craigslist for eight hundred dollars. Yeah, it doesn't actually go anywhere, but it is red, and it is ostensibly well, a sports car. It makes for great Instagram posts. Because you just no, kind of push it out onto a road, <laughs> get somebody to blow a fan in front of you so it looks like you got like a scarf blowing back and your hair's blowing back and it looks like you're driving it, right? And then you yeah. just post those. And if anybody ever checks on it, you'll it, the illusion immediately <laughs> falls apart. But it looks cool for a second. Just reminded me of a... <laughs> There's just a picture of a kid who's just like leaned over this beautiful quartz countertop in this beautiful kitchen. It's just like... I'm 18 years old, or I'm 18 years old, and I just bought my first house. You can too. And Snoop Dogg retweeted it with just, "Boy, if you don't get out of Home Depot right now." <laughs> 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 I think the kid was trolling because it was very clearly in Home Depot, but it made me laugh. <laughs> and I also am laughing at all the the Instagram fake influencers who rent private jets just so they can get pictures and stuff on them. But yeah. hey, yeah, that's how you deal with a quarter life crisis. You go buy an $800 Miata that doesn't go anywhere. You take pictures and you get fake internet likes. That's what drives me. And if no one likes your pictures, buy likes because then tomorrow you maybe will forget you bought the likes and you'll see them on the post. Oh, uh, yes. And you'll buy be happy the likes. Again. Drink yourself into a stupor. Convince yourself the likes were yeah. real. Fall apart. <laughs> <laughs> Great, great life advice. All right. So I know people have quarter life crises. I don't think I had one where I was like, oh no, I'm I'm old. I definitely had the realization, and I think this was last year, or maybe it was 2017 at this point. Um, it kind of hit me like the day that I had been out of college just as long as college was. So like four years after oh, my yeah. college graduation, I was like, oh no, I'm you know, those days are just behind me totally different person now but i try to focus on the time i have left and what i can do with it because there's a lot of time left and uh maybe i'll have to update my inspiration when i become early 40s but i'm just always reminded of how steve carell did not really get a big break in acting until he was in his 40s i mean now he's doing all kinds of great stuff but he went all through his thirties, twenties, all that without really having a big break. So his prime was way later than yeah. when, what somebody would assume would be your mm -hmm. prime. So I'm never, you know, I'm, I'm going to hopefully <clears throat> maintain this mindset forever, but I'm never going to say oh, I'm past my prime. Maybe I'm past one prime, but I'm on my way to the next prime. Yeah. Well, I've, I've definitely felt past my prime when I like broke all of my abilities for a while. But I, I, I'd like to think that I'm reapproaching it. Yeah, you know? and, and it's I mean, getting like, better with time. You're better at piano than you ever were. Yeah, you know, at you're one better point, at public so speaking if, than if you, you ever think were. Like you're just ruined forever. You, we're not good at predicting the future. Nope. Actually, I saw this on one of my rare Reddit excursions. I ran into a thread where somebody was talking about, "Hey, what about what if your life's the same every day? I'm so scared of my life being the same every day." 
I've got a great life. I've got like a dog, a girlfriend, a job I like, but it's so repetitive. What do I do? And the, the top comment was just like, yeah, I had all that stuff. And now it's five years later. I don't have any of those. The dog's dead and I'm taking a one-way flight to Cambodia with $5,000. You don't know anything about the future. <laughs> you can't, you don't know. So yeah. there's no reason to have a crisis about it because everything could be shifted in just a year yeah. and you don't you don't know yet. And I mean, mm -hmm. I, I have plenty of crises. You know, I have an existential crisis, an identity crisis practically daily, but really the the age is not the the root cause of those yeah. things other than realizing the emperor's new groove is almost 20 years old. I'm fine. I that's literally a, watched that last of, night. It's a bit of a crisis Holds because up. I love that movie. But <laughs> yeah, like I guess the only way to respond to those crises is I've been trying to like this year I've been trying to reestablish what I care about actively. Mm -hmm. You know, kind of like the same thing with with the habits. You take away the stuff that's not bringing you joy. So I don't know. Just figure out what you really care about. Yeah. The age isn't that important. Well, I think the the quarter-life crisis, the midlife crisis, a lot of these, or a lot of what causes both of these is looking forward and not seeing a concrete next milestone marker. Because when yes. you're in school, it's like, oh, there's a test next week. I'm going to graduate this semester. I'm going to go to college. All kinds of cool stuff is coming up. There's like something to be excited about and a little scared about at every turn. And then... I would say that, you know, this starts to happen when you graduate, but it really ramps up when you get established. Once you have a long-term relationship, once you have a stable living situation, maybe you bought a house, that kind of stuff. You've got a stable job. You don't see a huge change coming around the corner. Yeah, it can start to feel like every single day is the same. And I have times when I'm really frustrated because it seems like I wake up every day and then before I know it, boom, I'm back in bed. So it's like, well, where'd I go? And I feel like one of the ways you can deal with this or at least, you know, stave off the possibility of having like a crisis is set up things that are coming up in the near future that you're scared of. Yeah, that's that are exciting. probably a good idea. You know, like um, I started doing vocal lessons six months ago. I was terrified to walk into that vocal booth with the teacher. I almost like I almost canceled as I was standing outside the building waiting for him. And I'm really glad that I didn't. But now I'm very comfortable going to my vocal lessons. I have no fear whatsoever. Even if I try a really difficult song, like I went and practiced a song that I was very confident I would sound terrible singing with him last week. No fear though, because I know like he's my teacher. Duh, he's not going to make fun of me. He wants That's me to improve. That's not a good way to get paid as a teacher. <laughs> yeah, and I probably wouldn't pay for lessons if he's just making fun of me. Maybe I would, maybe that's useful. Uh, but there's showcases coming up where they, they're literal ticketed events that the public can come to and you can sign up and you can have the, uh, there's like a band that works with my vocal school and they will learn the song you want to sing. So that's like the next scary thing coming up for me. That's cool. You know, and uh, it's, it's one of the more terrifying things I've done in my life. I would, I would be less scared to go climb a, you know, class five mountain right now. No, well, see, that's exactly why you got to do it. Mm -hmm. Because it's exactly the fact that we don't have semester changes anymore. Yeah. Uh, we're past most age-related cool things. Like, I can rent cars. Yay. That was helpful on a few trips. But now there's, it's, it's not there's coming up. nothing, <laughs> you know? And it's not that there's nothing, but there's nothing that anyone else is going to set up for you. Yeah, like at this it, point, it's not you automatic and it's not very things. predictable. You yep. you have to change your own life, which is why I like changing my system. Exactly why I would change good habits. Yeah. Because I would be like, I need a new semester now. Mm -hmm. I need something to look forward to. Because at some point, you want the stability of the things you like. You're like, I like my house. I like my significant other. I don't want to plan. I'm going to break up with them in five years just to mix things up. Yeah. You know, like that's not going to make sense. So mm -hmm. you're going to need to find other things to change on purpose. Yeah. And I think it's good to start doing that sooner rather than later because the longer you go without doing it, the more your brain irrationally starts to believe that you need a huge change. I need to delete my life and fly to Cambodia with $5,000 to my name. I need to buy a sports car and start dating other people because that's the only yeah, thing that's going to I think a lot of marriages happy. might fall apart due to this kind of repetition, mm -hmm. not realizing that the relationship itself may not be the core thing. Yeah. Yeah, like what? Yeah, what have you done lately that you're super excited about? 
you know, and also like a rele- relevant additional thing, like, do you have a date night regularly yeah. with your wife or your significant other? Well, yeah. And like, or what did, just kind of when existing? did you meet? What did you talk about? Right. Cause eventually you'll run out of new stuff to talk about. Well, the problem isn't that they've heard all your stories is that you're not making new ones mm-hmm. to talk to them about. Yeah. So where's the conversation going to come from? Mm-hmm. You can't just, don't just jump to a new person so you can tell your old stories and live off those. Like if I could go back, I, I could throw a football over the mountains. I'd take <laughs> state. That's not, you got to write new stories. Yeah. Something I think about a lot in uh, in game design is that, you know, every good game has like a loop or a gameplay loop where you maybe, so I'll give an example from the game I'm playing right now, SteamWorld Dig 2, which I'm not sure if you've heard of, but it's- I've heard of it. It's a Metroidvania game, kind of like Hollow Knight, mm, okay. uh, but it's got some like elements from Dig Dug and some like treasure finding. Dug. It's honestly really fun. But uh, I found myself really loving this game because there's this very satisfying loop where you go and you quest for a while and you- dig further into the mines you find treasure and as you keep going the game gives you more and more incentives to go back to base you have a lantern eventually your light runs out and you can still kind of get around the caves but you probably won't be able to see treasure blocks you you know you have a backpack that gets full eventually so eventually like you'll break a treasure block but you can't take it with you and you know the longer you you quest with a bag full of treasure like the more likely it is for you to die and lose all the treasure so you know, there's a, there's a slowly building incentive to go back, sell off stuff, refill your lantern, all kinds of stuff like that. And that makes the actual questing process very satisfying because you're not just doing the one thing. And I think game designers understand something that drives human beings in real life, where we need these loops, where we go do one thing for a while and then we go do something else, whether it be going back to base to rest for a bit or changing things up, going and doing a different activity. I mean, even in terms of like, you know, breaking away from the whole like rest and quest loop, which I'm not sure if anyone's coined that term before, but I like it. It sounds good. Rest and quest loop. Yeah, it's good. Uh, even when you're questing, like the the main areas of the game have you kind of like looking for treasure and getting to the next main area, but there's also these little diversions like side temples where it's more of like a puzzle solving thing, or maybe it's a combat trial. Any other game that you can think of probably does things like this, like Breath of the Wild. It's like exploration, but maybe that's a combat trial. Now there's a big puzzle to solve. Now there's a a big dungeon to do. Human beings aren't satisfied doing the same thing all the time. And I think that's what gets us into these crises. We kind of get into these habitual patterns where we're stuck at base for years, or maybe we're stuck out in the wilderness for years. We never come back. You have to have these oscillating states. Yeah, that's a really interesting point that, game designers kind of have to know this because how else do they drive you through 80 hours of gameplay Mm -hmm. or you you, they have to kind of know what drives people yeah yeah exactly it's an it's an interesting point there's probably a lot to be learned about how you can optimize your life just taking lessons from game design that is exactly why i'm writing that down (laughs) as an idea (laughs) video idea yeah yeah because i mean they've done all this study to figure out you know what motivates you like you said what what drives someone to get through an 80 hour campaign in a game yeah, it's probably and at the root. You can have a lot of repetition similar. in there too, because a JRPG, right? The the fights, all that stuff. There's a ton of repetition. Yeah, and yet it still feels more motivating. So mm-hmm. if my life's filled with a bunch of repetition, what's different that would make the repetition motivating in one case? Yeah, and not in another. Hmm. There's there's something there. Yeah. Well, maybe that's a new video. <laughs> yeah, just because I was I was thinking about that the other day. I was like. The main thought in my head is why, because I started playing um, Super Metroid. I was at Matt's house and he has that like Super Nintendo remix console and it has Super Metroid on there. And I was like, this game is fun. And I've always liked Metroid games. Why do I like Hollow Knight so much more than Metroid? And why am I finding myself enjoying SteamWorld Dig so much more than Metroid? One of the big reasons is those two games have a much stronger rest quest loop especially SteamWorld Dig, but even Hollow Knight has like the dirt mouth town at the beginning of the game where you can go up and you can talk to some characters and you can kind of chill and you can buy some gear and then you go back down to the dark caverns and, you know, be afraid that something's going to pop out and scare you at any, any moment. Metroid is very lonely. It's very isolating. Yeah, you know, there's that is part of the vibe of the game. Yeah, there's save rooms and I guess you could just go like chill by your ship at the you know at the top of the map but there's nothing to do there the entire game is pure quest 
And there's certainly pacing, right? I mean, it's masterful game design. So I'm not like saying that they've missed out on a common or, you know, crucial element there, but there's no like fun hub area to go just chill at. It's just constant. You're alone in a hostile alien world, alien world. Like you get to yeah. leave when you're done. And it's like, it's like <laughs> kind of the point for that thing, but it could, that definitely would explain why you're so much more enamored of these other ones. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And personally, I, I like having a kind of safe spot in the game to go chill at for a while. Not constant stress 100, yeah. 100% of the time. Mm-hmm. You know, and most, most games build those kind of loops in in maybe different ways, but that one really spoke to me at least. Anywho, did you have anything on Quarter Life Crises or should we move on to the next one? No, nope. I have a crisis every day. Reestablishing what I care about <laughs> is the answer. Okay. All right. Last question then. Uh, many jobs almost force you to become the product you're selling and require strong personal branding, but I'm not sure I want my personal life related to my job. So should I build a brand around my real name and past or come up with some sort of persona or a pseudonym? Um, obviously, this depends a lot. There's a lot the, of on the here. job. Yeah. Because it would be really stupid to be to try to be like a top surgeon and <laughs> and be like have some cool name that I can't even think of a, a cool persona name for a surgeon. Johnny Tsunami. Yeah, it's like uh I don't know if that's a real People thing or aren't going to trust a surgeon or a banker to do anything that's personally branded. So obviously they should just well, use names. I think that there may be um a middle ground here. So we have a friend, and I'm not going to say who this person is because I don't know if they want their real name out there, but we have a friend who has their real given name, and then professionally they go by a different name. But it's a reasonable name though, right? It's, it's it sounds – it doesn't – it's not It's not Johnny Tsunami. It's not DJ, Johnny Storm. DJ Brain Surgeon. It's not I don't, I DJ can't, you know? Bacon. It's, it's, just, it's just a name, right? Okay. And this person has gone by that name professionally online for a long time. And it's worked out perfectly. They have a good job. They have a decent personal brand. All right. But it's different than the real name. I also have another friend who's a YouTuber. Um, total pseudonym. You know? So you can do it. I just, I, it's not something I've ever done. And I actually consider doing it. Yeah. I think this was back in 2011. So College Info Geek was fairly new. And I had this brief consideration of going by a different name because there's already the Thomas Frank political author who wrote What's the Matter with Kansas. And, you know, when you Google him, uh, I think maybe I'm first now, but for many, many years, like the first page was devoid of anything I had ever done because it was all just him. Wall Street Journal review of his books, Wikipedia article, Twitter, all these kinds of things. Uh, It took me a long, long time to build up a personal brand that actually broke through the stranglehold that guy had on page one of Google. So I had actually considered changing everything. And the reason I didn't was I kind of felt like, oh, I already have College Info Geek. There's already, you know, 90 people coming to the website a day and my name's on it. Like, I don't want to get rid of that. And, you know, in hindsight, it's like hilarious um, how little that was. But uh, I don't regret not going by a pseudonym, but I don't know if I would regret having a pseudonym if I had done so i don't i mean i guess if you're gonna pick a professional sounding pseudonym that can make a lot more sense but it it also depends a lot on what you're doing this works really well for internet stuff yeah but if i go into like uh, an agency and i i do some development work at an agency and i go by a fake name and they're like why isn't that what's on your license and i'm like mm-hmm. i thought it'd sound cool like <laughs> 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 they're not going to take me seriously unless I have That's a true. good re- unless unless I have a good reason or something. But it's yeah. it's going to be weirder if it's something where people run into you in person and they're it's fully true. aware that's not your name. You know, I don't think it's a huge deal. Again, like going back to the example of our friend, they've had no problems. Yeah, and they do they it. are employed. It's not like they're working for themselves. Uh, but yeah, there may be, you may have to explain, like when they ask you for a W9 or something, they was like, this isn't your name. You should well, have a good reason it is. that you can, a good explanation it doesn't even mm-hmm. need to be the honest reason. As long as it's a reasonable one, that's not going to be, I thought it sounded cool. Yeah. But I mean, there, so know? there's another option, right? If you want to build an online personal brand where you become like well known as an authority in an area, you're probably going to be communicating about your subject somehow whether it's through blog posts or YouTube videos or podcasts or what have you. And you can build 
a name around that, like you can build a brand that isn't a pseudonym for yourself, like College Info Geek. Yeah. I could have very easily downplayed my name. In fact, a great example of this is our friend Andrew Fiebert, Little Money Matters. You know how many Twitter followers Andrew has? Like a few hundred, because he does not care about his personal brand whatsoever. He cares about Little Money Matters as a brand. So everything he does is under Little Money Matters. Maybe on the podcast, he'll be like, my name's Andrew, and I'm here with Matt, but he's never just like, follow me, Andrew Fiebert, blah, blah, blah. He's just he's like, follow Listen Money Matters. So if you wanted to build up expertise and an online brand that is somehow attached to whatever your area of focus is, you could do it under like a publication. That's yours. And it could even be a single author blog or a single author YouTube channel. It's just not your name. Yeah. And then your name just doesn't get that well known. You know, like uh, the channel Wisecrack. They have over 2 million subscribers. And there's one guy who I think his name might be Cody. But you know what? I don't know his name. I know his face. I've seen yeah, his videos. They didn't, they didn't make their personality the important mm -hmm. part. They're, Millions they're of person. people have seen that guy's face on those videos. But I don't remember his name because he doesn't make it important. It's not like Wisecrack by this guy. It's just Wisecrack. Yeah. So... I wouldn't worry too much about attaching your personality to your professional presence. I think there are ways to minimize that if you want to maintain a bit of separation. And I don't think you need to use a pseudonym to do it. That being said, if you want to use a pseudonym, I don't think there's a reason that you shouldn't. It's just don't feel obligated to if you want that separation. Yeah. You know, especially if you're looking to someone like me as an example of what happens when you do attach your name to your work, because I have honestly been very deliberate about that like there there's there's work that has gone into it and i could have cared less you know so i think that's it that's all i need to say you know i don't think your name is super attached to your profession i mean a little bit but less i don't even this sounds really weird, maybe, coming from a podcaster and, a, and a, who ostensibly talks about productivity and branding. I don't care about my personal brand. I, I don't <laughs> care if I – I don't ever tweet. I, on, I'm yeah. on Instagram to share photography and occasionally a piano clip, mm -hmm. but almost never to share details of my personal life or emphasize my name. Yeah. You know, it doesn't – it's uh, – I don't, I don't care. I mean, the, the reason that you are a – public persona at this point is like a sequence of yeah that sounds reasonable events like hey do you want to be on this podcast episode with me Back yeah it, it wasn't because i no had a drive listening. to build my own yeah like empire i mean you you being on the podcast was i think the start of that was me having the idea that it would be hilarious to do like let's plays and do podcasts while we're playing video games because i wanted to be like game grumps you know, I take inspiration from all kinds of weird places. And I'm like, well, I got to have friends to play games with. So, hey, yeah. do you want to be on a podcast? There's and those no video were admittedly a little less focused. They were a little less focused. But, you know, you kept doing them. And then eventually you did a few, like, real episodes. And then all of a sudden it's like, hey, you're the co-host now. Yeah. I don't think you're really ever intended to be a podcast co-host. It just sort of happened. Nope. You know, it's just. Yeah. And there therefore, cool my ideas. name's not a big deal it is unique enough though that i do think i take up the entire first page of google true i've you pushed do. out the german doctor okay so ha <laughs> take that i'm experiencing I schadenfreude bet in, i bet in germany he still comes up probably <laughs> but as far as americans who want to learn about the german doctor you're gonna have to go to page two <sighs> sorry everyone who wants to learn about the german doctor i don't know why you do <laughs> I, I it's not really relevant yeah but yeah, you do have a more unique name than I do. So but you've like at the same time, there. I just don't care. So. Mm -hmm. And I do care. And I don't know, past me would probably feel guilty about we'll switch having names. that big of an ego. But we'll just, we'll switch it's names. It's fine. Like it's, I just. It's that easy. Yeah. I'm cognizant of my own flaws and weak spots. And one of them is that I do care about my name having recognition. I'm actually going to go know? by Martholomew Kensington now. <laughs> 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 my new brand is fancy i don't think you would have to do any work <laughs> like literally just make that a or website just, and boom just, first page google for that name done until i also take that name oh, one no. of us is gonna have to change 
Mm. <laughs> this is awkward. <laughs> this is awkward. This is also, I think, where we should end this episode. Yeah, probably. I think we've talked about enough here. So this is episode 257, which means if you want to find the show notes for this episode, cigpodcast.com slash 257 is where you can go. We'll have links to anything we may have mentioned. I think we mentioned Habitica and B-Minder and a few I'm, things I'm like not going to link to buying 8,000 live crickets. You'll need yeah. to look for that yourself. You can find that on your own. It's not that I hard. respect the sovereignty of those 8,000 crickets, and it will not be by my hand that they are released into somebody's room. That's true. I feel like a lot of them pointlessly die if you do that, no matter what you do. And you're going to no be terrified. You are. Well, I'm going to be terrified. I'm not going to like it, you know? And even it's if you're true. not terrified and you just try to, like, step on them, your room's going to be disgusting. <laughs> yeah. But it's, good. it's just going to be a gross experience. Just leave the crickets alone. Yeah. Okay. They were just we, minding their own leave business. Them alone. We don't need to be putting them in people's rooms. <laughs> uh, otherwise, cigpodcast.com without the slash anything on there is where you can go to find out how to maybe subscribe to this podcast on Spotify or Google Podcasts or Apple Podcasts. So if you're watching this on YouTube or you happen to be listening to it in your web browser and you want to subscribe to get the audio episodes delivered to your device every single Monday morning when they come out, then that is where you can go to find out uh, how to do that, or you can just search for our podcast on Spotify, Google Podcasts, whatever. And if you want to support us, a great way to do so on Apple Podcasts, if you are an iPhone user or uh, use iTunes at all, is to give us a rating and review over there. That helps bump us up the rankings, but also just gives us good feedback on how the show is going and how we can improve things. So big thanks to you if you do that, and uh, thanks as always for hanging out with us as well. Last but not least, collegeinfogeek.com slash resources, where you can find all of our favorite apps, tools, book recommendations, our dorm and college packing guide, all kinds of great resources for improving your life as a student. So check that out if you haven't seen it already. And I think that'll about wrap things up for this week's episode. So thanks for hanging out and we'll see you in the next one. Thank you.